do you know who said <clears throat> about a third of my cases are suffering from no clinically definable neurosis, but from the senselessness and emptiness of their lives. This can be defined as the general neurosis of our times. Carl Jung said that. Well, I'm not suggesting you, you fall into that particular category, um, but certainly for many people, yeah, there is a, a senselessness and emptiness in their lives. And I would suggest that the Buddha's teachings can help us in many different ways in the practical activities we go through day by day. The first thing, which we have already mentioned, the Four Noble Truths. In particular, the first noble truth, the understanding of that truth, can give us two benefits. The first is that it teaches us to be realistic in our expectations. Because dukkha is a truth and this is a situation in which everybody is we can appreciate that we can't get or shouldn't get attached to things in the belief that they will give us permanent or lasting happiness. That's just not possible. It doesn't mean to say we can't derive temporary happiness from all sorts of things in our daily life. Fine. But don't expect that they will last forever. So, be realistic. Acknowledge that whatever things you may have or have attained or achieved, they may give you satisfaction, they may give you happiness, they may give you pleasure, but they won't give you ultimate happiness. They won't give you ultimate pleasure. So, this, I think, helps us to adjust our expectations. Yes, many, many Buddhists are very happy people because they enjoy the present moment, but they don't expect it necessarily to go on forever and ever and ever. So, if we have something which gives us happiness or satisfaction, that's fine. But don't be disappointed when that condition changes and that may longer may no longer give us happiness or satisfaction. So that's the first thing I would say that comes from the first noble truth. The second thing is to appreciate the universal nature of dukkha. The Buddha phrases the First Noble Truth as the Noble Truth of Dukkha. When he's speaking to his five former companions in the ascetic life, he doesn't say to them, you and you are experiencing Dukkha. He just phrases this impersonally. The First Noble Truth is the Noble Truth of Dukkha. That means it is universal. There is nobody who is free from dukkha, unless an, the enlightened state is achieved. Everybody else, it doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter how much power you have, how much uh, money you have, how much of anything else you have, you are still mired in the world of dukkha. You will still have to experience, at the very least, old age, sickness and death. You will still have 
disappointments and frustrations, which the Buddha summarizes as not to get what one wants is dukkha. I don't care who you are. <laughs> Frequently, you are not going to get what you want. When we appreciate the universal nature of this, we can say, well, just as I am experiencing dukkha, I am experiencing frustration and disappointment, stress, so is everybody else. Now that is the basis for developing compassion. We are all in the same boat together. And just as I don't like this, this, this experience, other people won't like this experience either. So we can then feel the growth of compassion for all beings, because all beings are mired in dukkha. And if we're aware of that, that will have a profound influence on the way that we treat other people. So those are two things which I think we get from the First Noble Truth. Then we have the doctrine of karma, action. Specifically, it is the intention behind the action which is important. We are constantly performing acts of karma. We are constantly thinking, saying, or doing things which will be generating results, generating consequences. So every moment of your life, you can be aware of your motivations, be aware of your intentions, because every moment you are generating karma, and that will, sooner or later, bring about its result. So, when Jung talks about the senselessness and the, the emptiness of our lives, I don't think that's possible if we accept the doctrine of karma. Because there is a significance in all our thoughts, words, and deeds. And there is never a moment when we can't be mindful about this. Yes, sometimes we do act without thinking. We act carelessly. But that's not supposed to be how we act. We should always be considering. The Buddha said, before you perform any action, he said this to his son, Rahula, before you perform any action, think, reflect. Is this act I'm contemplating doing going to lead to my happiness, the happiness of others, the happiness of both myself and others? If it is not, then you shouldn't perform the action. If it is, then you go ahead and perform the action. And you reflect on this before you perform the action, while you are performing the action, and after you have performed the action. So that's a, that's a full-time job in itself, just thinking about karma and the results that we are going to experience at some time in the future, maybe in this life, maybe in a later life. But we can be very much aware of what effects we are creating by our various actions. Then we have three 
parts which are often used as the introduction to the Buddhist way of life. They are called dana, sila, and bhavana. Dana, English word donor or donation. Giving. And giving in Buddhism has a special significance. This is not giving in order to obtain some result for oneself. This is selfless giving. Giving for the happiness, the pleasure it gives us for giving. And by doing this, we can, first of all, feel good within ourselves. We can feel happy about it. Secondly, it creates social harmony. By giving freely to others, they will be happy. They will be made happy. We can give many things. We don't have to have lots and lots and lots of money to give. We can give non-material things. We can give care, attention, encouragement, sympathy. We can give even the observance of precepts, the five precepts. That's an act of giving. What are we giving with the precepts? We're giving to other beings freedom from fear. Other beings have nothing to fear from us because we're not going to say or do anything which is harmful to them. If you could go through the rest of your life without creating any hurt or harm to another being, your life would have been very, very well lived. Even if you don't go into the deeper parts of the Buddhist teachings. That alone, the observance of precepts, is a pr very profound action. So, when we talk about giving, we are giving, or we can give, many things. The important thing, above all, is that we should have no attachment. In the second noble truth, the Buddha tells us that the cause of dukkha is attachment, is craving, is thirst, tanha. And this form of giving is done in order to overcome tanha. So we're giving without attachment. That means, first of all, we're happy to give. There should be no reluctance to give. Sometimes we do feel reluctant. We think, I don't really want to have to give to this person or that person, but I suppose I've got to. And we do it reluctantly. Or we, we do it almost in a, a fit of anger, just to get rid of somebody who's pestering us to, to, to give us, to give something. That's not true giving. We do giving without expectations. We don't expect a particular result. We don't expect gratitude or a good reputation for generosity, praise from other people. That is entirely unimportant. We give simply for the pleasure of giving. This is something which I had never really encountered before I met Buddhists. 
and this has been for me a very amazing, a very important practice. Sri Lankans, I think, are all brought up to give. The Buddha said, if you realized, as I do, the value of giving, you would not fail to share even your last morsel of food. It's such a valuable practice. A few years ago, I had the honor to accompany our then head monk to Myanmar, to Burma. He had been given a, 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 a title, a, a, um, what we might call in Western thought, um, some kind of um, gong, like, you know, OBEs and all the rest of it, that kind of thing. So he was invited to go to Myanmar to receive it. And the ceremony itself, there were about 330 monks being honoured, took place in a large hall where it was very hot, and it went on for hours, about three hours, all in Burmese, so I didn't have a clue what was going on. But at the end of the ceremony, the monks pulled up a line, and in front of each monk was his, um, was his baggage carrier and sidekick, so that was, in my case, where I fitted in. And we, we made a procession out of the hall, and I thought, well, that's wonderful. Now I can get a glass of water or a cup of tea or something. No. That was just the prelude to going on a little procession through some of the streets of Myanmar. And people had lined the streets with gifts. Different people had set up trestle tables. One was piled up with robes, another with toothpaste, another with umbrellas, another with sandals. As we went along, somebody would come over and, and offer this to the monk. And what impressed me so much was the clear, clear, clear pleasure people took in this act of generosity. I can remember one little boy of I know about four or five years old. He was given a, a bank note, probably in our money worth almost nothing. But he was running up, big smile on his face, happy as anything, to be able to offer that. Very, very impressive experience for me. That's the first time I'd really seen giving in, in action. So we can practice this every day. You don't have to have a pocket full of money, but you can give, as I said, non-material things, care, attention, help, encouragement, and so forth. So that, I think, is a very important and valuable practice which we can develop. It takes, it takes a certain amount of practice to get into the swing of this, but it's a very wonderful thing to do. And then we have sila. Precepts. These are designed to get our verbal and bodily actions under control. We take them on a daily basis. Usually at the beginning of the day, we like to recite the precepts. And we're taking them just for that day, because to take a vow that we're going to keep them unbroken for the rest of our life <laughs> is possibly a very tall order. But at least for today, I'm going to do my best to refrain from, and then we have the five precepts. 
And if we can get to the end of the day and review and can say to ourselves, okay, today I kept my five precepts, then we can feel good about ourselves. We can feel relaxed. We can feel happy. There's no regrets coming into the mind. There's no remorse. No, oh dear, I shouldn't have done that or I wish I hadn't said that. We've gone through the day doing only wholesome actions, actions of speech and actions of body. So this brings happiness to ourselves and it means we can live on good terms with our fellow beings. So the precepts give us a foundation for our daily life. We have to be aware of them, but if we can keep them, then we are living what is called a blameless life. Nobody can legitimately blame us or criticize us. Yes, people will still blame us, will still criticize us. The Buddha himself was blamed and criticized. Um, by various people at different times. But that was not legitimate blame. But we can go through our lives leading a blameless life. Just imagine if everybody in the world could just keep five precepts. 99% of the world's problems would vanish. Mostly they arise out of some sort of selfishness and detachment. So, when we talk about the precepts, we've got to remember right speech, using speech which is truthful, beneficial, pleasant to hear, not using lies or harsh speech or backbiting, tail-bearing, not wasting our time in idle gossip. Then we need right action. That means refraining from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, And then we have right livelihood. Not living our life in any way which is cheating, underhand dealing, dishonesty, fraud. Okay, maybe those are fairly extreme things that I think perhaps many people manage to avoid. But we need to be aware of the impact which our life and our livelihood have on others and on the environment. Environment wasn't such an issue in the time of the Buddha, but I think it's becoming an increasingly important issue today. And we have to be aware of how our actions impact the environment. That's very important. And I think it's going to become increasingly important as the years go by. Uh, you know, Buddhism is, is really the, the ultimate, um, call it a green religion, because it teaches respect for other beings, respect for the environment. There's a verse in the Dhammapada that talks about how a bee visits the flower. He takes just what he needs from the flower without damaging the flower or destroying it. Just takes what he wants and he moves on. And that is used to describe the life 
of a monk, but also can apply to us as lay people. We take what we need, not a matter of greed, but need, and we have to be careful not to damage the flower, not to damage the environment. So that's a very important consideration, how we go through our day-to-day -day life, is the impact that our actions are going to have on other beings and the environment. Any questions or comments? All okay. Okay. A lot of that has to do with levels one and two of what the Buddha taught happiness in this life, happiness in later lives. But as I said, the ultimate goal is the state of enlightenment. That is the third level. And this is where we need to start developing our understanding, which is the first factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. I mean, we need right understanding right from the word go, but it is at this stage that we are trying to deepen our understanding having a right view of things and also samasankapa, right thought or right intention, translating our understanding into right actions. And this part of the path consists of bhavana. I said dana, sila and bhavana. Bhavana means mental training or mental development. Often used to, use, it is translated as meditation. Well, <coughs> the, the English word meditation means many, many, many different things. Hello. Um, in all sorts of different contexts. So it's a very flexible kind of word and not everybody means the same thing when they talk about meditation. You can have followers of other religions talking about meditation that not necessarily meaning what Buddhists mean by meditation. It's a bit like the word uh, music. How many different kinds of music are there? many, 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 and so there are different kinds of meditation. But in the Buddhist use of the word, bhavana is the training or disciplining of the mind. And we have the practice of uh, right effort, samavayama. Right effort, there are four sorts, two connected with unwholesome states of mind and two connected with wholesome states of mind. So the first two are to prevent the arising of unwholesome states which have not yet arisen. And number two, to try to eliminate unwholesome states which have already arisen. So that again is a pretty much a full-time job. We're trying to stop the arising of the three uh, unwholesome roots of greed or attachment, hatred or aversion, and delusion or non-understanding. Those are all unwholesome states. So with the right effort, we can try to hold these in check. And then the second two forms of right effort concern wholesome states. The first of those two is to develop 
wholesome states of mind which have not yet arisen. And then the second aspect is to maintain, to make much of wholesome states which have already arisen. So we can be constantly aware of the state of our mind and be aware what is going on. Am I detecting an unwholesome state or a wholesome state and what action can I take in respect of these states? We shall come to this in more detail next week when we look at the whole practice of bhavana, meditation, and in particular as explained by the Buddha in his Satipatthana Sutta, which is his comprehensive statement on the subject of meditation. But before we get into next week, we have another factor of the path to consider, which is sati, mindfulness. Again, this is a subject which has, seems to have lots of different interpretations. In the last few years, this word sati has mm. blossomed, and there are all sorts of classes, lectures, teachings about mindfulness. Has anybody attended a mindfulness class? Where, can I ask? Um, the National Health Science, like the AE course of that. Right. I've also read John Kabat-Zinn's work on mindfulness. Uh-huh, okay. Mm. Did you find it a helpful course? Ah. Uh, Headspace. 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 Oh, yes, yes. And I've also followed his talk, he's just like you would say, mindfulness is great, but let's not lose the compassion yeah. of doing things and embracing it. It's wonderful and it gives us an amazing jolt. Mm. 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 So many people lose the essence of themselves. Well, this is a, a debate at the moment. Should mindfulness be taught as a secular practice without mentioning anything to do with Buddhism. Some people say if we start talking about Buddhism we shall put off a number of potential participants because they will say we don't want any of this religious junk so don't stuff that down my throat. So you could say that more people are being given the benefit of the practice of mindfulness by deliberately refraining from mentioning any of the context. On the other hand, there are other people saying, no, this is not correct. The Buddha did not teach a noble one-fold path. He taught an eight-fold path. Mindfulness is one factor among eight and it is not correct to teach only mindfulness without putting it into context in the rest of the Buddha's teachings. The Buddha did make a prediction he said, eventually, this Dhamma that I'm teaching will become corrupted. And then it will become forgotten about. And the world enters a dark, dark period when there's no teaching available. And then at some very, very distant time in the future, another Buddha will arise he will discover the same truths 
that this Buddha discovered and he will teach them and then people will be able to benefit. But there is a fear that this teaching of mindfulness by itself could be the start of a corrupt practice which could lead to disastrous results as far as Buddhism in general is concerned. So I think there are two possible points of view on this matter and I think as yet there's no universal agreement. Judy, you said you did also a, a mindfulness course? Where was yeah, it? Ah, oh, right, okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's an Oxford Centre for Mindfulness which seems to be doing some good work. Um, but I think another consideration is that for some people now it is becoming their means of livelihood. They conduct classes and they expect to be paid. I mean, they've got bills to pay, so they, they expect to derive an income from it. That rather changes the whole flavour of the teaching, in my opinion. Um, up till now, I think it's true that the Buddha's teachings have always been made available without a charge to anybody. Donations? Yes, you can make a donation, but um, I, well, there are a few there are a few retreat centres where you are expected to make a financial contribution to the cost of your stay. But that's really just to maintain the centre to provide the food that you eat and that sort of thing. It's not providing anybody with an income. So that's another factor to be taken into. Uh, consideration. I don't know, what do you think? Is it a good thing to separate mindfulness from everything else? Or? I, I was wondering about, the, I went to a conference a few years ago mm -hmm. in Germany about it. They, they started off by saying mindfulness, I think it can mean something to remember. Mm -hmm. And then they went to the traditional, well, modern meaning, which is just present moment awareness, just mm -hmm. being able to be mm -hmm. present. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then, even in my first tradition, I found the Rati way, the emphasis really was a few years ago on present moment awareness. I think you're dead right. There is some possibility of different interpretation. As we shall see next week, mindfulness does indeed, it, it is derived from, I think it's the verb is sarati, to remember. It's not that mindfulness is an act of remembering, it is because you do something with mindfulness that you can remember what you've done. So, if you find yourself wondering, um, did I... Um, did I switch off the lights at home before I left this morning? It probably means you didn't do the switching off with mindfulness. If you did it with mindfulness, you would be able to remember. Oh yes, I remember doing that. So, mindfulness is often coupled together with another word, sampajanya. Sampajanya means clear comprehension. So mindfulness is indeed paying attention to the present moment, but the sampajanya is understanding what it is that you are being aware of in the present moment. And this is where the Buddha's Satipatthana Sutta, which I mentioned, uh, has a lot of important guidance and advice. But Sati by itself 
it's got to be directed in some way. You've got to have some measure of understanding what it is that Sati is revealing. If you're just paying attention to the present moment, well, so what? You've got to have something else there to to um, evaluate the experience, to be aware of what is going on. And yeah, I don't know. I don't. I haven't really looked into all the various um, ways of teaching mindfulness at the moment. But I'm not quite sure how much of the rest of the teaching is getting in there with it. So I think at the moment <laughs> there's a lot of um, there's no clear sense of direction. I think part of the problem, of course, is that. Buddhism is not a hierarchical faith. There's not one person in charge at the top who says, right, this is what we are going to do, this is what we're going to say. It's very much up to individuals to do what they want. And that is perhaps a weakness in the way things are organised. But there is great enthusiasm for the practice of mindfulness. I don't know if you read a a parliamentary report, an all-party report called Mindful Nation UK came out a few months ago. Very enthusiastic, supported by a large number of MPs saying that in areas like health, uh, workplace, there is great potential for mindfulness practice to be very, very beneficial, and they're advocating that there should be a scheme to train, is it 1,200 teachers a year, or, or is it 1,200 teachers over three years or five years? I, don't, I forget, but anyway, they want this whole practice to be given a real push. But, of course, it is a problem, then, to make sure that the teachers are of a sufficiently good... Um, level that they have enough knowledge and experience. So anyway, back to the, the daily life. Um, when we move to the right understanding level, the samaditi, what we're trying to become aware of are what we call the three characteristics of existence. Ti lakana. A characteristic or a sign. Three signs of being, three characteristics of existence. And these are anicca, dukkha, Anatta. Nietzsche means permanent. In Pali, if you put an A in front, that's negative. So, not permanent. We're trying to become aware that everything is impermanent. To begin with, we can try to understand this on an intellectual level. We can read uh, read books that talk about the universe and how everything in the universe is, is either growing or collapsing. It's exploding or changing in one way or another. The universe, although we look up at the night sky and see all these stars, look pretty well fixed. Actually, there is huge change. The universe is a very violent place. And that factor of change, of course, goes down even to the subatomic level, where all these bright physicists are talking about uh, the constituent um, elements or 
particles, the elementary particles which make up atoms. And all of those, we're told, are in a constant state of movement and change. So from the very big to the very small, there is change. The Buddha said that all there is is arising, coming to be, and uh, dissolution. Nothing lasts for longer than a split second. There's nothing within us, nothing around us, nothing outside us, which you can point to and say, this endures. It doesn't. We may, get the, we may form the impression that it does because we can't actually perceive the change with our own naked eye. But there is change going on. And this is one of the, this is, this is a constant, in a world of inconstancy, this is the one constant factor, change, change, change. We don't normally see that, but it is there. And we can, we can learn about this, we can read about it, we can look at other forms of knowledge which explain this to us. We would call that a kind of second-hand knowledge. Uh, knowledge that comes to us from outside. Which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that, but it's not, it's the lowest level of understanding. When we start to examine something and think about it, and we deepen our knowledge, deepen our understanding, that is a, a better form of wisdom. But the best form of wisdom comes from direct experience. And in the practice of meditation, we are using our body and our mind as a laboratory. We are, we are observing what is going on from moment to moment in the body or in the mind. We can't be aware of everything simultaneously. But with development of this practice we call meditation, we can begin to get direct experience of change. There is uh, uh, a remark made by one of the Buddha's nuns when she became enlightened. She said, the world is nothing but vibration and combustion. Nothing lasting, nothing permanent. Vibration and combustion. And she reached this on the basis of her own personal investigations, not because she was told it by the Buddha or anybody else. She had looked into the matter and she had come to this understanding by just observing. So that's the highest form of understanding. And that is in fact the experience of enlightenment. But before we get quite that far, and Nietzsche is the first of these three characteristics. It's the easiest one to experience directly. So that is where the practice uh, focuses, becoming aware of impermanence.
but then that leads on to dukkha, because the Buddha said, yada nichang tad dukkang. Whatever is impermanent is also dukkha. Why did he say that? Because if something is impermanent, it must be, in the ultimate sense, unsatisfactory. It can't give us permanent happiness. So whatever is impermanent is also dukkha. We're not going to get freedom from dukkha by clinging on to things which are always changing. If we try to do that, I hope we're going to build up problems for ourselves. We're going to build up disappointments and frustrations and other difficulties. So that is the connection between impermanence and dukkha. And impermanence also helps us to get insight into the third of these characteristics, anatta. There was at that time the word Atman. Atman was said to be something permanent, something eternal within us. You can call it a soul, or the self, the Atman was not destroyed at death. The Atman continued on to another state. And many religions teach a soul which continues on after death. There is room for differences of teaching. Some religions teach that after death the soul goes to a permanent place of happiness or unhappiness, to heaven or hell. Other religions say no, the soul puts on another body, like you put a new set of clothes onto your body tomorrow from the ones you're wearing today. And this process may continue, but eventually the soul is, we hope, going to experience some kind of eternal happiness. But the Buddha said no. No soul. No Atman. Before we get deeper into that, would anybody like a cup of tea? Mm. 